everybody. Brianna Whitney, host of the True Crime Arizona podcast here. Normally when we're recording a podcast, we're editing these, we're looking at older cases, but we wanted to bring in a group of journalists today because we've had a lot of significant updates in a very high profile beating death of a 16 year old at a Queen Creek Halloween party that happened on October 28th. We're talking about 16 year old Preston Lord. Uh, his his murder was unsolved. It's been unsolved. And now for the first time, we know that the Queen Creek Police Department has submitted a referral for charges to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office in connection with Preston Lord's homicide. We know that seven juveniles and adults have have been part of these charges. We don't know if the juveniles and adults means that's kids and adults like parents, or if some of these people who are involved in these charges were 18 years old, and that's why they're referred to as adults. So we have got a whole group here to kind of break down what we're looking at in this case. Um, there's been a lot of community engagement, a lot of community concern from the East Valley about what's been going on, and also just more of a widespread East Valley violent situation with teenagers and young adults. So we've got Morgan Lowe, chief investigative reporter here. We've got Emma Lockhart, weekend anchor and reporter, and we have Casey Torres, a reporter at our station. And the reason why I brought all three of you guys in is because you all have had different involvements either in this case, in the reporting, in the coverage of it, or Morgan also looking at kind of the, the legal position on this, what happens next, the process, because nobody has been arrested. And we have to make that clear. There's been no arrests in Preston Lord's death yet. The Maricopa County attorney, Rachel Mitchell, will now determine what charges she will go with, or it could be none at all. Morgan, I want to bring you in first on that on that front. We know Preston Lord was beaten to death. Mm -hmm. He died at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Um, a lot of community concern. There have been walks, there have been vigils. Um, but where we are now with the Queen Creek Police Department submitting these charges, a lot of people will ask, well, why didn't they just make arrests? If, if they have the, the means, they have an idea of who may have been involved, why would they submit these to the county attorney's office? Yeah, and, and th this is one of the unusual parts of this story because normally you have a crime that's committed, police make an arrest, and prosecutors charge the defendant. And, and we're missing that second part. What we know is that Queen Creek police believe they have enough evidence to charge seven people. We don't know who these people are. We don't know the specific charges. Uh, one of them might be murder. A couple of them might be murder. It might be um, accessory. They might be hindering investigation or prosecution. There's a, a wide range of charges. And it is odd. You know, normally the police make an arrest, prosecutors charge, uh, they might have an arraignment, right. or in other cases, there may be a grand jury indicts the uh -huh. people. This is 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 a little different that being said um it is common in maybe not these high profile cases for police to investigate a crime and then forward what they believe should be charged to the prosecutor's office the police have one job collect the facts look at them and say what does this look like now prosecutors take that and they say okay we have this evidence would that evidence sustain a conviction for these charges? And, and so they're looking at it two different ways. And the prosecutors have to say, what is the likelihood that we have enough evidence to convict? So what could happen from here? Prosecutors could go ahead and file the charges. They could send some of the cases back to Queen Creek Police and say, we need some additional investigation here. We need some additional evidence here. They could send them all back. So. And, and how long this could take, this could take a while. I am, this is a high profile yeah. case. I'm assuming that there is pressure on the prosecutor's office to get this done quickly. We know there's com community yeah. pressure, parents pressure. And, and, and the issue here is they have one shot at this. Mm -hmm. Once you file charges and, and um, and if it, the case falls apart, you're you're in trouble as a prosecutor. So they have to get it right first. And you know that that has to be frustrating for the family of the victim and for the other families of other kids in that area who have been 
frightened, you know, rightfully so for the last couple of months because there are either one or multiple killers who have gone free because this kid was this kid was beaten to death. It was awful. And, and I had heard questions a couple times. You know, he was at a Halloween party in a neighborhood where there was assumably not only a bunch of kids with cell phones and things that could record video or take pictures, but also homes that may have had surveillance footage or or doorbell cameras, things like that. A lot of people have said, gosh, there's got to be video of this. So there's phones. Why aren't you know phones? Are they being checked? Because it, it did take a little while. I do want to explain with a search warrant, police can't just say, I'm going to grant or, or get a search warrant because there were phones there. Wouldn't they have to have either reasonable proof or a reasonable idea that somebody caught this moment before, during, or after the crime itself to actually get a warrant granted to seize a phone? Yeah, and it has to be, they have to identify a specific person who they believe has video of this incident. And they can't just do a blanket search warrant for anybody who might have been there. So that is a tedious process. You can imagine it, one of these out of control parties and this party was apparently did attract a lot of young people. They have to identify the specific people and then get enough information, enough of a factual basis to go to a judge and say, we have this evidence to believe that this person has information on their phone or on their person that is germane to this criminal investigation. And we just don't know exactly what they have, but that would answer the question then of people asking, couldn't they just go and look at all these people's phones? They can't just do that without having reason to believe that somebody had right. the video or picture of the incident. That being said, there is nothing that precludes someone who was there who has that video from coming forward and saying, you can take it. Correct. It, I want. I have this video. I want to cooperate with this investigation because this kid was killed. Nothing prevents that from happening. Where you get the search warrant is when you have an unwilling party. Uncooperative. Yeah. So we know that this is the situation going forward. I want to bring in Emma and Casey. You guys have both covered this. Casey, I want to start with you because we, we know that Preston was a student, a junior at Combs High School. There has been a lot of talk, not only in the community, but at city council meetings. And you've covered, I think, several of those. Can you talk about your coverage and what was discussed in those meetings? As obviously people were worried, there was fear, um, and people wanted something to be done. Right, they were really trying to push for justice. And I went to two city council meetings, one for Queen Creek and Gilbert. Uh, parents were there. They're all wearing orange. That was Preston Lord's favorite color. And they were pushing for transparency, too, from the police department there. They're saying, why aren't we not knowing what you're doing, when you're doing it? We have no answers. They were comparing it to two other cases as well, um, where teens were uh, killed and saying, why have there been arrests in those cases and not in this case? And it happened weeks before. So they were, they were pushing for change and answers. And when I spoke to parents there, they say they're scared for their own children. They don't want to let them out anymore. They're trying to see where they're going, kind of keep tabs on them, and they're fearful. I tried to speak to some parents on camera. Many of them said no. They don't even want their faces to be on TV because they're worried there could be targets, believing that the people that did this to Preston Lord will go after them. Was there any resolve, anything that came at the end of these city council meetings of, okay, from our, our council leaders here, we are going to do this, this, and this. And and you did make a good note too. You went to Gilbert and Queen Creek. Mm -hmm. Queen Creek is the police department investigating Preston Lord's death. Gilbert is investigating some other East Valley violence cases that involve teenagers. So was there anything that the that the council members said or or did that would change things? What they're saying right now is they did condemn the violence that they're seeing with teens. Uh, they're saying it's a growing problem within the communities around us. They do want to try to work with schools and students and try to get that trust with adults that they're seeing that might be the problem. It might be that they're too scared to speak forward, but it's really asking the public as well to give us the tips, bring the tips in. They're saying, if you're posting this on social media, there's not much that can be done about it. You have to file a police report. And that's what both, both police chiefs for Queen Creek and Gilbert 
also addressed with the public, asking them, bring those tips in, don't just go on social media. And it's hard because in the Preston Lord investigation, as well as some of these other East Valley violence investigations, people are seeing videos, pictures, information spread like wildfire on social media, especially TikTok. And that's something that us as a news organization has to be very careful of. We know that these things exist out there. We know what's being talked about. We know who is being talked about. But as a as a news station and journalists, we cannot and will not go on air or on record with anything that's just hearsay without official confirmation arrests charges police naming certain people we we won't report any of that until it is confirmed or unless it is confirmed and so we know people listening to this probably have seen a lot of things on TikTok, on instagram on reels on twitter all of that and 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 rightfully so we understand that a lot of people are concerned but it is important to note that that we have to be careful with the way that we report things emma i want to bring you in um it we are on Friday today, um, December 29th. That's yes. a math question. Wow, yes. I think about <laughs> the year's gone by fast. Okay, so Friday, December 29th is when we're recording this. It was yesterday on Thursday the 28th that news of the charges being submitted to the county attorney's office came out. Emma, you were covering the story before that announcement happened. Can you just take us through the process of your day, why you were covering Preston Lord's case yesterday in the first place, and the reaction from his family, friends, and supporters, and just the community when they learned that development? Mm -hmm. So yesterday marked two months since Preston Lord uh, was killed. So the community was coming together, holding a walk at a high school in Gilbert and then heading to the Gilbert Police Department. And a lot of the people were on their way to the walk when they learned about the news that the Queen Creek Police Department was submitting recommending charges in this case. There certainly was a lot of relief from people um, that this was, you know, a step towards justice, but still a lot of frustration in the community because it took so long to get here. And, you know, this isn't the end. There's still some work that needs to be done. But also still, you know, going off of what Casey said, a lot of fear in the community because not only Preston Lord's case, but some of these other violent attacks on teens that haven't been resolved, no one has been arrested. And there's just, again, a lot of fear in the community. They requested police escort yesterday at this walk. And I think that just really goes to show how this is really gripping the community in a real way. Yeah, and uh, Preston Lord's family, they spoke at the vigil, right? Or at least his stepmom? They did. and. You know, they were talking about memories of Preston and also pushing for people to speak out. The Queen Creek Police Department said, yes, we submitted these recommended charges, but we still need people to to follow through and submit tips. This investigation is still ongoing. So they really were encouraging people to do the same, to speak up. Some of the people at this walk, family members said that people are not cooperating. Police are telling them people are not cooperating and that's frustrating. I also noticed in the video from the walk, they had these signs that said upstander. Do you know, what does that mean? I think again, telling people to speak out if they see anything, hear anything, know anything to contact the police department because that of course can help in the investigation and the case because they want this to be a strong case and they want to see some resolution with some of those other assaults that have happened in recent months impacting teens in the East Valley. Basically, don't be a bystander, but do something about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've heard all four of us reference these other East Valley teen violence cases. Um, it's a sensitive subject, and the reason why is because there's a lot of talk about a certain gang that is in Gilbert. I want to preface this part of the podcast with the fact that we do not know there is no concrete evidence as of now that this gang and the teen violence associated with it and Preston Lord's death are connected. We do not know if they are related at all. So we have to make sure that we are adamant about that at this point in both of these investigations. That being said, there have been a lot of talks about a gang called the Gilbert 
Lagoons. It is all over social media, and we have chosen at Arizona's Family to not give a lot of time and attention to this specific name of the gang in our newscasts. A couple reasons why, and Morgan, maybe you can help me out on this part of it, mm -hmm. but for one thing, we don't want to give attention to a gang that is doing these things because that puts more of a spotlight on them that also can encourage other people to do copycat things, things like that. We do not normally name gangs in investigations and stories that we do across the board, no matter yeah. no matter where in Arizona it's happening. So we need to make sure that as journalists we're being fair and that we're covering this responsibly. Um, we also do not know if they are connected. That being said, Gilbert PD has provided a little bit more information about it. So because of the community being very up in arms about these potential Gilbert goon cases, there's an FAQ part of Gilbert PD's online website now um, that answers some of this. The question is, is Gilbert PD investigating the group identified as the Gilbert goons? This is how they answer it. Initially, Gilbert PD did not have any cases where the victims or the suspects refer to the group Gilbert Goons. However, some recent updates from victims are now referring to their assailants as being associated with Gilbert Goons. We are actively reviewing our assault cases involving youth to see if there is any additional information or correlation between these incidents that can assist with our past investigations. Emma. I do believe too that you were told yesterday there's there's four active cases. They the Gilbert Police Department just reopened four cases involving assaults on teens and talking with a lot of people at the walk last night and parents they feel like that's because of pressure from the community to reopen those cases. I actually spoke with a father who says his son was attacked at the In-N-Out in Gilbert back in August and there was really no traction on the case, but recently it was reopened. Uh, so he's really frustrated with how everything has gone. And he was so concerned with his son's safety that he actually sent him out of the country. Wow. Gilbert PD also addresses this in and out situation. So they, they actually, I believe, put out video um, of an attack there. There's been some incidents. You talked to the, the father that knew about that one. The question on the FAQ on Gilbert PD's website is, did Gilbert PD officers notice a trend involving incidents at in and out Here's the answer. Over the past year, Gilbert police officers noticed an increase of incidents of assaults involving juveniles at the in and out in Gilbert. However, while the location was similar, according to our reports, each incident involved different individuals. Throughout the last year, our patrol, our patrol teams were directed to increase their patrols of these locations, which also included assigning officers to the area at and around the business. There were never any documented references in our reports to the group Gilbert Goons. So they're aware of these incidents. It looks like now they're looking into this. People have, you know, been talking about the Gilbert Goons because there's been this rash of East valley violence situations preston lord obviously was beaten and killed as we know in the east valley but as of now we do not know if any of those seven people that they are submitting charges for are involved in that gang at all morgan yeah this is not the first time you've heard of gang violence in the east valley you've actually reported on it decades before yeah and, and if you live in Gilbert, if you're a Gilbert town city leader or police, you, you just sort of cringe when somebody says gang and Gilbert because this is not the first time that Gilbert has had a notorious gang of, call it a gang. When we say gang, a criminal street gang is actually a legal phrase and that, that might be why Gilbert police has been reticent to sort of associate the Gilbert goons as a, a criminal gang because there are a lot of legal consequences that, that comes when that, that is said. But 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there was a gang in Gilbert called the Devil Dogs. And the beatings that they um, carried out on other kids really sound a little, you know, sound similar to what we are hearing here with, that's happening out there. And, and a couple of the members of the Devil Dogs 
uh, were prosecuted and went to prison, even went to adult prison, even though they were juveniles at the time. I covered one of the sentencings um, back then, and, and, you know, the community was, how could this happen in our town? Gilbert is one of the, considered one of the safest communities in the country, and yet you have, you know, this type of situation. And it, and it just, for those of us who have been in the news business or have lived in the valley for a couple of decades, it's just eerily similar. The devil dogs and 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 this sort of group um, that that's popped up now. The types of attacks that are attributed to both of those groups. You have to imagine the biggest difference probably in the in the investigations back then and now is just the fact that we have so much digital evidence yeah. and, in a lot of these cases and Gilbert PD we know they have video they've put some out right and coincidentally that is why they were able to get these prosecutions 20 plus years ago of the devil dogs because they would videotape really the meetings and wow. so that was used as evidence you know kids young people videotape everything but that that was one of the first real cases where you had the we'd look at it in the newsroom. What can we run in this story? Because it was so brutal. Wow. So we are aware of the fact that these investigations are ongoing. We know that Gilbert PD has now put out at least formally that they are looking into these cases, possibly being related to the Gilbert goons. We do not know at this point if Preston Lord's death is related. We hope to learn who these people are in a timely matter, but Morgan, I've seen this go both ways. When charges are recommended, sometimes the county attorney doesn't decide on those charges for a while. What do you think is a likely timeline here of when we'll know something? Uh, it's really hard to tell because we haven't seen the police report. So sometimes we'll right. see the police report and, and you say, wow, there is a lot of evidence here. We just don't know what evidence they have. We don't know the charges. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively certain there's got to be some video that shows some of these you know characters these people being involved but then it gets a little trickier when you're um you're charging somebody as a an accomplice you know did the person hinder the prosecution did the person help did the person cover something up um is this being viewed as a criminal street gang where one of the members commits a crime and the other ones are also uh charged with those crimes because of a conspiracy law um, there's just a lot of, you know, intangibles here that um, un un unless we were able to see what the police have, it's tough to say when we're going to see something from the county attorney. Yeah. You know, uh, Rachel Mitchell holds news conferences every two weeks. I guarantee you yeah. every two weeks we're going to be asking what what's going on with this case? What's going on with this case? I, I think one of the things you know, one of the reasons why Gilbert police may have come forward and said, look, we've submitted recommendations for seven Queen Creek. people. Oh, Queen, Queen Creek. Creek. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, submitted recommendations of charges for these seven people is because that seven, that's an eye opening number. Yes. And it may get other people to say, well, I didn't know if so and so was really that involved. But since they're charging seven people, hey, look at this person. Right. I mean, it shows the community that they're serious about this and that this is a multi-person, there are multiple suspects here. Yeah, they don't believe Preston Lord died at the hands of one person. And right. I think that is important with people coming forward. They also noted that they have done dozens of search warrants that have been executed. That's a lot of search warrants. And that could be anything. That could be phone search warrants. That could be house. That could be car yeah. i mean the, those are those are several places that could be done so if they've done that then they clearly have evidence enough to charge they believe seven people with some sort of crime in, involved in it but we may not see all seven potentially charged with murder yeah and and those search warrants dozens of search warrants so if you think about what what how police use phones now you know, you can use a phone to tie a person to a location at a specific time. So it is very possible that the investigators in this case have looked at the cell phones that were in that 10 to 15 foot spot at that exact time and have, have um, executed search warrants on those phones, have identified the owners of those phones. And that may be one of the, the real ways that they were able to track some of these people down because 
you know, from covering other cases that you and I have both covered, Brianna, we know that investigators can tie people to a, a specific spot. Oh, yeah. Like a spot in a yard mm -hmm. just by the cell phone coordinates. I don't believe that this case is any has anything to do with DNA. And I feel like usually we're talking about DNA, but this is a case that's going to rest, I think, heavily on digital evidence and word of mouth. Yeah, it's not just the video. It's the fact that they had their phones. Yep. Yep, digital evidence, huge footprint there. Um, I do want to say they there is a tip line that people can submit tips anonymously if they know anything. I think that's still so important just because there are seven people that are a part of these recommended charges does not mean that the investigation is over. And it doesn't mean, too, that if you know something that the police don't, that they can't add more recommended charges. Mm -hmm. So anybody with information um, can submit tips to the FBI who's been involved helping Queen Creek or the agency's toll-free tip line. That's 1-800-CALL-FBI. The numbers on that are 1-800-225-5324. We're going to be staying on top of the investigation. We know that so many people in the community not even just the East Valley, but all over Arizona are paying attention to this case. They're concerned, they care, they want to see action. And more than anything, I think everybody just wants to see justice for Preston Lord, who certainly did not deserve to die. So we will be staying on top of this. We wanted to be transparent about our coverage on air why we're choosing to do things a certain way and how you can expect us to cover this case and these other teen violence cases and investigations going forward. Um, but we wanted to get everybody up to speed because there's been so many questions. This has been a months long situation and investigation so far, and there's obviously a lot more to go. We'll have an updated podcast when we know more, especially if we know what's going on with those charges. But again, we are looking, we are we are invested in, and we care as a news station about Preston Lord, about what's going on in the East Valley, and we are committed to covering it in a responsible matter. So I wanna thank all of you guys for coming, Morgan, Emma, Casey. I know not all of you guys are usually on the podcast. I appreciate you coming in with your insight, the coverage that you, all three of you have provided, um, and just the fact that you guys have taken a lot of time to do great journalism on this case, too. So I appreciate it. True Crime Arizona will stay on top of it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for the podcast. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.